A very good evening to you all. My name is Chantal Valerie Onyango. I am very grateful for your presence here today and for honoring our invite to grace this occasion as we launch the Rig or Be Rigged book by Honorable Emilio Diambo. Today, I want to take you through a few pieces of legislation that Honorable Milly has sponsored over the years. And this just speaks to how amazing she is as a legislator, a brilliant legal mind, and somebody to aspire to um, in political leadership. So I'd want to take you first to uh, the Counter Trafficking in Persons Act. Honorable Mili sponsored this bill, and it's actually the first of its kind within our country. And it essentially places an offense on matters which are trafficking. And initially, this was something that was not recognized. A lot of issues came in as sexual offenses or were placed under the Children's Act, and they were not really being recognized as trafficking. Uh, next, I'd also take you through the Victims Protection Act. The Victims Protection Act is also legislation which is one of its first of its kind. And what it does is it places the victim within the forefront of the legal system. And as a lawyer, I can tell you that before this act in 2014, what used to happen is that victims were simply witnesses of their own crimes. They weren't being, uh, you know, integrated within the legal system. And what would happen is that they would purely be witnesses. And what this act does, it actually brings victims into uh, the fore within the legal system. It enables uh, judges and magistrates to actually ask the victims, how have you been impacted by this crime? Uh, what exactly would you want to see from the legal system or the outcomes uh, of this crime? And this is a brilliant, brilliant piece of legislation. I think we are, this is probably um, the only kind within Africa. So kudos to Honorable Emilio Diambo on that. Another brilliant piece of legislation, because we only expect brilliance from Honorable Mili, is the Treaty Making and Ratification Act. So what this does is that during our, after the 2010 Constitution, what happened is that Article 2.6 of the Constitution actually requires that our, every single piece of treaties or any our conventions which are signed by this country automatically become law, right? So what this means is that if today we ratify a convention on the rights and protection of children, for instance, you can actually take this piece of legislation to a court uh, directly. And this wasn't actually happening before 2010. So what this act actually does, it it's operationalizes Article 2.6. And what it um, specifically, it actually requires that when uh, you know, treaties and conventions are signed by the executive, then parliament actually has to give approval. And this is based on Article 94 of the Constitution, which also makes parliament the sole making, uh, lawmaking body within this country. So this just operationalizes that. Next, we have the assisted reproductive our healthcare bill, and their sister reproductive for the members of parliament within the House. Our, this bill is actually currently before you. It went on second reading recently, and our, actually, sorry, it's on the committee stage, and uh, you will be debating on it very, very soon. Um, our, actually, it's on the committee of the whole House, sorry. So what this bill does is it speaks towards uh, issues concerning surrogacy, it speaks towards issues concerning uh, in vitro fertilization or IVF as some of you might know it. And it actually begins to recognize that there are persons within, our, uh, within this country who cannot conceive naturally. And because of this, then they are able to get different methods which can aid them 
in our conception. So this is another um, piece of legislation which is going to be very, very helpful to this country and I encourage members of parliaments within the House to actually pass this piece of legislation. Then I want to speak a little bit more on the Family Reproductive Health Bill. This bill is also sponsored by Honorable Millie and currently we are waiting for it to be uh, pub to go through publication. So it's not currently before the House, but it will be very, very soon. So what this bill speaks on, it speaks on a number of issues. And our, a lot of it speaks on issues such as um, obstetric violence, for instance, something that is a very novel idea for many of us. And obstetric violence basically refers to situations where a woman uh, goes to uh, give birth in a hospital, and instead of being treated with care and dignity that she deserves, then she's actually treated by nurses, doctors, and other healthcare practitioners um, in a very undignified way. And sometimes this can include insults, it can include, um, you know, very, very, uh, even physical violence sometimes. So what this bill does, it, it creates an offense uh, which is liable to punishment. Right now we have put it at 500,000, but based on public participation, actually people are saying that the fine should be even more. And of course the years as well should be more. Uh, it also talks about our issues concerning uh, maternity leave for, um, for persons who have had stillborn children, right? So what we have right now within our Employment Act, it only speaks towards issues where uh, a woman has actually successfully given birth. So where you haven't given birth, then you're not entitled to maternity leave. And this bill is trying to address that, it's trying to say that, in fact, regardless of the fact that you have not uh, given birth to a live child, then you still require this maternity leave. It also talks about low share leave, which is closely related to that. And it also talks about nurseries for lactating mothers. And it mandates governments to actually create lactating stations, nursery stations for parents and their newborns to, um, to actually be able to breastfeed their children. Uh, something else that it also talks about in extensively is uh, issues concerning infertility counseling for men. And what you'll notice about this bill is it takes a life cycle approach, which means it's trying to look at from the time you're born, what are your reproductive health needs? Uh, as an adolescent, what are your reproductive health needs at that particular time? And then as you grow on older, whether you're a man or you're a woman, what exactly um, do you need? And the, the, the issues that concern these different age groups are usually very different. And therefore, this bill is trying to address that. So it looks at uh, issues, uh, even concerning men, uh, what kind of issues are they facing? A lot of you might have heard of issues such as, um, you know, taking of Viagra or very dangerous pills for men, and that is something that this bill is trying to cure. It also talks about uh, adolescents and their reproductive health needs. I'm sure many of you know that we have a crisis in terms of teenage pregnancies, and therefore this is something that the bill is trying to talk about issues such as um, education for children and adolescents so that they know what they're getting into when they're having sex. Uh, I've spoken about the life cycle approach. So this is another issue that the bill uh, uh, takes um, lead on, and this is the reproductive health of advanced uh, persons. And these people are usually within their 40s, their 50s, generally people who are going to go through menopause in the near future. And it tries to address their reproductive health needs. It also talks about uh, the reproductive health needs of gerontological persons, who are persons who are much older or significantly older or are past the reproductive health care or reproductive health um, age. So these are usually people within their 60s and so on. 
and it just uh, recognizes the fact that sometimes not all persons who need reproductive health care are people who are actually, uh, you, know, uh, you know, trying to have children. It also talks about uh, reproductive health care needs of persons with disabilities. And you will notice a lot of the times that persons with disabilities, of course, face a lot of discriminations and a lot of hurdles in getting access to any type of service. And the bill essentially talks about reproductive health care of persons with disabilities in the sense that it allows for systems and creates our mandates government to actually conduct trainings, um, give information, things like sign language interpreters should be within our hospitals, and so on and so forth. I'd lastly like to talk about issues concerning intersex persons. And the bill extensively speaks about intersex persons. And these are persons usually who you cannot identify whether they're male or female because of something within their biology, right? So the bill, for instance, creates an offense that in the event that you mutilate an intersex person, so you try to align them with one particular sex because you cannot identify them as male or female. And this usually happens, especially in instances where you know, um, the father or the mother of the child wants either a male child or a female child, right? And when they cannot identify that child uh, as either male or female, then what will happen is that they will actually perform surgeries which actually mutilate these persons and then later on in their lives, they might want to be identified as either male or female, but their genitals have already been mutilated, and therefore they're not able to either procreate or have a, 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 worth, a life worth living. So in a nutshell, this is what the Family Reproductive Health Care Bill speaks towards. Uh, these are some of the bills that Honorable Mili has been sponsoring within Parliament and we congratulate her for her efforts. I know a lot of you, if you've seen those bills, you will say, wow, this is a really, um, a, is a bill that has been done very, very well. So with that, I want to end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much.